So good afternoon, everyone, Toro University, California students, faculty, staff, and just sending a special warm uh, welcome to our community partners and friends. Uh, my name is Gail Cummings. I am the program director for the public health program here at TUC. Uh, this noontime talk is an extension of our social justice and public health series, Public Health in Times of Pandemics, that was hosted by the public health program officially uh, concluding in the fall of 2020. But we are so fortunate that um, one of our speakers, Dr. Gupta, is returning to kick, who kicked off the series with his talk on COVID-19 and the impacts on global and local communities, is returned today to share and provide us an update on the state of the pandemic and what we can expect over the next coming months around vaccinations and uh, steps toward mitigation, hopefully. Um, we are so pleased that uh, he was uh, flexible and able to fit us into his extremely busy schedule. For those of you who were not in attendance to his first talk or first half of his talk, please allow me to quickly share his bio. Uh, Dr. Gupta is a Harvard-trained lung specialist who spent 15 years working worldwide to improve public health for organizations, including U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, the Harvard Global Health Institute, the World Health Organization, and the Pentagon Center for Global Health Engagement. Given this diversity of experiences, he is now a trusted advisor and contributor to the national and international media outlets on several of the most important health issues today, COVID-19 being one, um, including serving as a regular health policy analyst for NBC News and a contributor to the New York Times and the CNN, CNN Day. Uh, Dr. Vin is committed to voicing evidence-informed perspectives across a range of critical issues like domestic U.S. health care reform, the vaping epidemic, the effects of climate change on human health, gun control, etc. In doing so, he speaks honestly and his, is driven by evidence, um, which is so important to our field and not opinion or, or dogma. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Vin Gupta um, for his chat and continuing his conversation today. Remember to post any questions that you have into our chat box and I will turn it over now to Dr. Gupta. Gail, thank you so much uh, uh, for the warm uh, re-invitation and to, to have me back to speak to uh, the Toro community. Um, there's a lot that we could talk about in the time we have together, uh, but things have changed dramatically in, in just the last two months. And so let me try to level set up front with the current state of the pandemic uh, and where we go ahead so that we can start to really plan our lives and hopefully plan a summer vacation, um, if not in the front end, at least on the back end. Um, and then hopefully, certainly um, a normal holiday season in 2021, um, something that we were deprived of in 2020. So where are we? Right now, uh, as you, you turn on the news, um, or if you just look at uh, the COVID tracking project, if you Google the COVID tracking project, or go to covidactnow.org or healthdata.org, you'll see that um, numbers of, hosp uh, of people that are hospitalized with, with this virus that are dying as a result of this virus have never been higher. I truly, it, it's, the numbers are, I, I think we've become numb to this reality, but 200 to 300,000 deaths, or rather cases a day, we have about 130 to 150,000 people hospitalized across the country with this virus. And just yesterday, while, while our new president was inaugurated, 4,400 Americans died. I mean, these are numbers and I say this as a pulmonologist, um, but also with the data science uh, role here at IHME at the University of Washington, these are numbers that we didn't even forecast. At, at Back in April and May, we were saying, well, it's likely potentially that 2,500 or 3,000 Americans may die at, at the peak of this pandemic sometime in the winter. I mean, we are exceeding that number by a large margin. And we're, we're assuredly going to be reaching where we estimate approximately 570,000 to 600 souls will, will be lost to this pandemic by May 1st, approximately May 1st. And there's a good chance that's going to be well exceeded. And, and there's a lot of reasons why. 
one, as Dr. Fauci and as others have said all along, if we entered the winter at a high baseline rate of case transmission, which is what happened, lots of cases as we entered a colder season, that things were going to be bad. And they're, I, I would argue they're worse than what we even anticipated. And the reason is that respiratory viruses like COVID-19 like cold weather. They like to transmit themselves in dry, cold air. It's just, it's just perfect. It's a perfect environment. And so we have cold weather across the country. We have people huddling indoors. And now we have a new strain you've probably heard about from the United Kingdom and other places like South Africa that we think might be more transmissible, if not more deadly, it does appear that they're more transmissible, meaning that if you get exposed to this new strain of the virus, you're more likely to get infected. So what does that mean? That means that now more than ever, vigilance, infection control measures, wearing the right type of mask, a three-ply medical or blue mask, so to speak, three layers, three-ply, um, is vital. Really at all times, whenever you might be interacting with somebody at, say, um, in, in a public setting, so a grocery store, going to the drugstore, going anywhere in public, uh, that you need to wear a three-ply mask. You must wear this. I ha and I have to say, I've seen a lot of neck gaiters out there. I've seen a lot of just one-ply cloth masks, thin material that's not going to get the job done and won't protect you, won't protect your loved ones. Social distancing. I, I'm I, I'm tired of saying it. I bet you're tired of hearing it, but super important. And avoiding unnecessary things like leisure travel right now. I know I I mean I think leisure travel is necessary, but it's not emergent. And so we got we need we need to not get into airplanes or trains. You need to pause travel, and the reason why is we we think because of this new mutant strain this uh, that, that seems more transmissible there's really nothing we can do in public that wouldn't pose some risk to you getting exposed and infected with the virus it's just it's really dangerous and so absent having an n95 mask which is not available to the public and, and really you know wearing a face shield um, absent and being in an outdoor setting, it's really, really risky, in my view, to be in an airplane cabin or to be in an indoor setting of any type that's in, uh, that's where you're exposed to other people you don't live with for any period of time. It's just not the right time to do that. Again, 4,400 people are dying every single day. And so I, I'm not coming with just bad news, but I'm trying to level set here that because we're distracted uh, with our politics, because the news media goes from one topic to the other, uh, because they're also fatigued and don't want to talk about coronavirus all the time. We, we've accepted this new normal that should be unacceptable, 4,400 people dying every single day. We have a change in administration. I think you're going to see a different tone. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this is a disaster every single day. And we can't let our foot off the pedal here. There's a lot of things that concern me. Uh, we were seeing, especially over the holidays, a lot of people still decided to travel um, and, and walk and talk themselves into this notion that, well, it's everyone else that's at risk, but I'm good. My family's good. And I'll tell you right now, uh, I, I was just in the ICU for a stretch uh, over the last few days, and I care directly for patients who were exposed because they had a younger member of the family travel for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And then they were subsequently exposed at home over the holidays. This is real. And I've heard it time and again in Texas, friends in Utah caring for patients. It is extremely real here. We're not trying to be fear mongers here. So, uh, so one, protect yourself, protect your loved ones, avoid things you don't absolutely need to do in public, like travel and wear the right type of mask. So that's one. I will say that um, because there's some degree of vaccine hesitancy right now, people are worried about the process in which uh, uh, the pro the process by which vaccines were developed. Was, was it rushed? Was there political interference? All types of um, things are being thrown around, and I understand why people are naturally concerned about vaccine quality. What I will say is 
I have cared and my colleagues have cared for people as young as 16, all the way up to 88, if not older, with this virus in the intensive care unit. And a third of young individuals who end up getting infected and hospitalized with this virus end up actually in the intensive care unit. They may not end up with bad pneumonia, but they will typically end up with blood clots that can cause a stroke. This is not that uncommon. So what's my message to all of you? My message here is the vaccine, the vaccine will keep you out of the ICU. We know it will save lives. That is beyond a shadow of the doubt. These vaccines are remarkably effective in keeping you out of the intensive care unit, protecting not only yourself, but your loved ones who might be older and more predisposed than you to a bad outcome if they got infected. So it is vital, all of you, especially it is vital that, the, uh, that our young people across the country in your own individual communities are getting the vaccine when it's your turn and messaging on it with your friends and convincing your family members if they're hesitant to get the vaccine. Because you know what? Despite all the politics and all the noise, this vaccine will save lives and it's gonna save your life and it's gonna save the life of older loved ones in your neighborhood in your own community, in your own family. And so it's vital to get this vaccine to save your life. The side effects here, and I, I got to, I'll, I'll, I can prove it here. I have the documentation I'll show it to you right now. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm putting, I'm actually speaking from experience. I got two, my two vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine. Day, I, uh, the first dose I got was on December 16th, the second dose on January 6th, 21 days apart like the science says. And that first dose I got, I had some soreness in my left arm. And actually, um, I, I, I talked about it and did it on air for today's show. So if you Google my name and vaccine, you might be able um, to see it because we went in depth about the science behind the vaccine for these some of these segments we did for, for TV. But the idea here is right after that first dose I got on December 16th, you know, definitely felt sore in my arm for six to eight hours, uh, didn't feel fatigued, didn't have a fever, felt nor felt really you know, normal by the end of the day. So that first shot didn't really feel a thing uh, past some soreness for a few hours. The second shot, 21 days later, I definitely felt fatigued. I definitely felt soreness in my arm and I felt like I had to go to bed early. So I'm, I, that second shot uh, put me out for a bit. I slept it off, next morning felt fine. So there is definitely after the second shot, you should prepare that you're probably going to feel fatigue, maybe a little malaise, body aches, sometimes happens with the flu shot, but it goes away quickly and just plan on having an early night and going to bed and feeling like yourself that next morning, if not sooner. But do know that, that uh, you might feel a little bit more, uh, 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 a little bit more tired after that second, uh, after that second dose, if you're getting the Pfizer, the Moderna shot. and so. Mild side effects are not uncommon, but they're mild. They go away. They're no worse than what you might feel like after that flu shot. So keep that in mind and message on that. If people say, well, you don't, we don't know about side effects. We don't know if this is safe. It's a darn safe vaccine and it's going to save your life. And the more of us that get this vaccine when we're eligible quickly, the quicker we can start really safely planning summer vacation. And, and, and making sure that you can go home for Thanksgiving safely, seeing your folks or other loved ones for Christmas in 2021. The longer we let this play out, the longer we delay on vaccine uptake, the, lo the, 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 the greater the chance, number one, that we're not gonna have a normal holiday season, or we're not gonna have that summer vacation. And then number two, the greater the chance there is for a mutant strain to develop that is resistant to these vaccines. Because the longer we let this outbreak go out of control, the, lo the, the greater the ability for COVID-19 to, to, to really change and escape whatever immunity these vaccines are providing us. So it's a critical that we get vaccinated as quickly as possible and really address hesitancy head on. I'm looking at all of you to help with that because really you are powerful messengers through your platforms talking to your friends, talking to your loved ones to really emphasize this message. 
what I will lastly say is that the vaccines themselves right now are effective against the strains coming from United Kingdom, coming from South Africa. You, and there's a lot of headlines right now, but these new strains popping up in California or elsewhere, 20 states, we think probably it's in every single state in the country right now. Uh, we just don't have that sequencing, that fancy lab capability to detect it everywhere, but it's probably everywhere. So that's one. And two, right now we know the vaccines are effective against these strains as well. But again, referencing what I just said earlier, remember, the longer we let this outbreak go out of control, the longer, the, the longer that period of time is, the more likely it is that a mutation will occur or a series of mutations will continue to occur that might make a new strain arise that will be resistant to the vaccine. So we need to diminish that probability. And the only way we do so is get this outbreak under control quickly by vac getting vaccinated quickly and addressing hesitancy head on. I've been talking for uh, probably 15 minutes straight. So I'm gonna stop talking and um, see if there's any questions. Great, uh, Dr. Gupta, there are a series of questions in our chat box and I can, I don't know if you can take a look at them or I can sure. help. Uh, yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Let me, um, gosh, okay. So you have a few in the Q&A and then there's some in the chat. If you wanna start with the ones you can see. Sure. Um, so. So uh, the first was from Sharon. Um, would you discuss the efficacy of the of the vaccines? So absolutely. So there's there's a few vaccines in the pipe uh, right now that are on the market. Everyone's probably heard now of the Pfizer vaccine. That's the one I got. Um, the Moderna vaccine, frankly, is very similar to the Pfizer vaccine in technology that went into building these specific vaccines. It's the same type of technology that built the vaccines, and there's two doses for both. One requires two doses, 21 days apart, that's Pfizer. The other, Moderna, 28 days apart between the two doses. Both doses are vital. You can't just get one dose and think you're good. You gotta get that second dose on time. So, and we know that if you adhere to that and you get the vaccine, not, these vaccines were 95% effective in reducing the risk of ending up in the intensive care unit with severe pneumonia from this virus. And severe pneumonia from this virus is what kills people. It's what gets them sick enough, short of breath enough to require being placed on a ventilator or life support. And so if, if you tell me something is 95% good or effective in reducing the risk that I'm gonna get end up, if, if, if I got infected, end up getting a severe pneumonia requiring that type of life support, there is no reason not to take it. And let me tell you this right now. So that's the efficacy part. And we, we know that Johnson & Johnson and other pharmaceutical companies are developing similarly effective vaccines that are likely gonna get approved in short order. We think Johnson & Johnson, which is a one dose vaccine, will get approved in the first week of February, given emergency use authorization from the FDA. That basically just means it's a tentative approval, but the data looks good. On, effic on efficacy and it's a safe vaccine. So that full approval will follow. Don't get too worried. I wouldn't get caught up in those, uh, in those technical terms, but what I'll say is Johnson & Johnson, a few other uh, vaccines are similarly effective based on the data we have. And there is no sense that any of the adverse effects, sometimes you'll hear that, oh, well, the Pfizer vaccine causes severe allergic reaction uh, to a healthcare worker that received it. And we saw a lot of media around some of those uh, intermittent, very episodic uh, cases. I think two in Alaska actually got a lot of press back in the middle of December. Here's the thing, and, and I say this as somebody, I, I'm actively just yesterday came out of the ICU caring for patients on ventilators with COVID-19. So I'm, I'm coming from direct experience here. I can treat a severe allergic reaction on the spot if it were to happen unexpectedly. What I cannot treat easily is severe pneumonia from COVID-19. And I'll tell you right now, 
I, I, in my ICU, I have 30 year olds. I have 70 year olds, 28 days on ventilators where we're putting them on their belly, putting them on their back. They're not able to wake up. They're not able to talk to family. It is awful what you're seeing in ICUs across the country right now, especially in places like Texas and in, in California and where many of you are right now. This is, it is an awful situation. So if you can get something that can prevent that from happening, you should do it. So these are broadly safe and effective, all of them in the pipeline. And they wouldn't be given emergency use authorization or this tentative approval if they were not. So please know that our government, despite media headlines, despite the, pol the political sideshows, our government, when it comes to approving these vaccines, are more stringent about what they're putting out in the marketplace than any other country in the world. Um, are KN95 masks better than cloth surgical masks? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, KN95 masks are better than cloth masks in terms of um, uh, keeping you safe. And KN95 masks in general are available to the general public. And you should be able to do an Amazon search or a Google search and, and purchase them. I would say that we need to move personally. If you had a choice between a cloth mask, uh, multiply cloth mask, or a blue mask, a surgical medical type mask that you can get at a, at a department store or a drugstore, go with this. And we, because this is better studied and there's more standardization in how these types of masks are developed than how cloth masks are developed. So I'm not saying cloth, uh, cloth masks are better than nothing, but these are better tested than cloth masks. So if you have the option, go with a three ply blue mask, medical type mask, avoid the cloth mask because they've been less tested, they're less standardized in terms of one cloth mask might be fundamentally different from another cloth masks in terms of thickness, in terms of the types of fabric that are built into the into an individual cloth mask versus these types of masks are pretty standard. They have three different layers. Each layer serves a separate function. And we know what goes into their into building these medical type masks. And we know that they're pretty darn effective. Uh, so if I had if if I was giving you recommendations here, I would say KN95 is is very good. Uh, some studies suggest it's even better. And the three ply blue type mask, I would say, in, in, in my opinion, the data isn't totally settled. So KN95 or a blue mask is totally fine. Both better than cloth masks. Definitely do not do a thin one ply cloth mask. And please do not do a neck gaiter of any variety. I see that way too often, especially amongst uh, young, younger folks. And, and, and it's just, it's not good. We know for a fact that those neck gaiters are not good. Can those who have the vaccine still pass the virus along from Gail? So uh, unfortunately, uh, you're gonna hear me say this a lot. Uh, we, d we don't know for sure. Moderna published data uh, that they're one of the companies that has one of the two ma major vaccines out on the market here in, in the US. Their early data suggests that not only does their vaccine keep you out of the ICU, but it, prevents transmission of the virus. So what does that mean? Right now, we know that if you get the vaccine, you're very unlikely to, if you got infected, you're very unlikely to end up in the intensive care unit. So it prevents the worst outcomes of this virus from happening if you get infected. What we don't know is, does the vaccine actually prevent infection? So I know it's weird. How can, how can a vaccine prevent bad outcomes from happening, but not prevent infection? And, and that's, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. We know that the, these vaccines will keep you out of the ICU. What we don't know is whether or not you can still get infected with it and maybe unwittingly pass on the virus as a transmitter to other people who have yet to get vaccinated, like your loved ones, for example, who knows? So that's why you're hearing Dr. Fauci and others still say, until we've reached a certain level of vaccination, herd immunity in our country, and that number has been in, in sort of the 60 to 70% range, until we've reached that number, it's still important to mask, to distance, to make sure you're practicing great hand hygiene, 20 seconds with soap and water, 
or with hand sanitizer, uh, soap and water preferred, and, and, and avoiding non-emergent activities until we've reached that level of herd immunity or until we have scientific certainty that the vaccine prevents transmission in addition to what we already know that it prevents bad outcomes from happening like pneumonia leading to the ICU. So I wanna be clear here. We just don't know the answer to the transmission question. We will hopefully have better data on this in the coming months, but until we either have that scientific clarity or until we've reached herd immunity, it's still important to mask and distance and avoid non-essential activities. I am a, <laughs> um, Lisa notes um, something that I also am amazed by, which is uh, the misinformation that still exists out there regarding um, what vaccination, uh, are other mischievous things happening uh, uh, not uh, when somebody's getting vaccinated, like a microchip being inserted into your body? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, and, and, and really, I'm, this is where all of us in public health are leaning on all of you, emerging leaders in public health and for our country to, to message that these vaccines are safe and effective and anybody putting uh, conspiracy theories out there you have to counter it. And I really do believe if we have consistent messaging from a variety of different stakeholders across demographics in these coming months, anywhere from community leaders on up uh, to national celebrities, it's, it's gonna be important. And I do think that that's gonna be effective because some of these things are so absurd that if enough of us counter it, it's gonna be helpful. But I think if we counter it, in terms of saying, if you get the vaccine and you encourage others to get the vaccine, life normalizes more quickly, number one. And then two, making it real for them, uh, what does this virus really look like if you got infected? And, and I know some, that's perhaps reliance on folks like myself to paint that picture of what is, what is it like to be in the intensive care unit? And I, and I think we have work to do there. We've done some of that in media, but we can do better in terms of making it real of how terrible this virus is if you don't get vaccinated, if you don't, and if you continue to, to be vulnerable to its worst effects. What is known about immunity post-infection? I've read about people being immune for three months or seven weeks or not at all post-infection. That's a great question. Um, this is, uh, a CDC guidance here suggests, and I think most of the literature suggests the same, um, so there's consistency here between what CDC is saying and what the literature is saying, that if you've been infected, you are likely protected from reinfection for about three months after your initial infection. There are exceptions. We've seen any uh, headlines of individuals who got reinfected within 30 days. And frankly, we, we are recommending that if you've been infected once, say on day zero on January 1st, by January 30th, uh, if you wanted to, you, uh, or if you have, say, consistent symptoms on January 30th, uh, with, if you, let's say on January 1st, let me be clear here, January 1st, you test positive for COVID-19. Let's say you, get, you got better by January 15th. 30 days after your initial diagnosis, we are now recommending that you could potentially get retested if, you start, if you're still symptomatic, because we think that that's enough that's enough time to have a lapse for you, to, your body to have cleared your initial infection. So it is possible to get reinfected as soon as 30 days after your initial infection. However, it looks like for the majority of people, you have, you, you've bought about three months of natural immunity if you've been infected. But again, there's, there's a wide variation depending on the individual. If you're younger, probably you're protected for a little longer. If you're older with pre-existing conditions, you're probably protected for a bit shorter period of time. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. That's why vigilance is required. Even if you've been infected, for, uh, I would still recommend that you mask, you distance, you keep doing all the things we're recommending until you get the vaccine and until there's herd immunity. What do you think about the KN95 masks for going to the supermarket, et cetera, from Sarah? I think they're fine. I would actually recommend, I think high quality masking in my view is a three ply blue mask, otherwise known as a medical or surgical mask, 
or KN95. I think those are many studies have demonstrated that those are both highly effective masks in keeping yourself safe and keeping others around you safe. I I would go further and say that if you have if you're old, older than 55 uh, and or have or if let's say you're younger but have a pre-existing condition or if you have a, a condition like rheumatoid arthritis and you're on an immunosuppressive drug. If any of those things exist, if you're older than 55, if you're younger than that with a pre-existing condition, or if you have, if you're on an immunosuppressive medication, then you should add face shield to, uh, or, or goggles or something. I, I have a ton of props here, guys. Um, so this face shield, uh, which I find pretty cumbersome here, but one of these guys, those are the medical look. Um, or, you know, some, uh, either some sort of, you can easily get these on, uh, uh, on, on Amazon or uh, something, or, you know, even these goggles here, um, some sort of eye protection. If you're, if you meet one of the categories I mentioned, if you're going out to the grocery store, or if, uh, if, if you're say in any other type of congregant setting in public and you meet one of those criteria, I would actually put on some, uh, some eye protection as well. Uh, but yes, no, I think KN95 is good. Do the vaccines not significantly reduce the chance? So Annette um, touches on something that uh, uh, sort of related to what we've been talking about a few times, just to emphasize this point, the vaccines, whether it's Johnson or John, Johnson and Johnson, AstraZeneca, Moderna or Pfizer, and I, sh I should remove AstraZeneca from that because there's some debate on their, on their vaccine quality. But Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and Moderna, all are very effective, very effective, greater than 95% effective in, in, in reducing the risk of ending up in the ICU with severe pneumonia. It is a no brainer to get them because the side effects are, if, if you're the rare person to have a side effect, we can manage that quickly. Again, those are manageable. It's like overwhelmingly likely that you're not gonna get any type of side effect whatsoever, or you're gonna have something super mild like I just described earlier, but you're gonna be protected. We again, do not know if these vaccines pre uh, prevent asymptomatic infection where you could unwittingly still get exposed, infective and, and pass it on to somebody who may, ha may not have gotten the vaccine yet and could end up having a bad outcome. So that's why given this gray area of knowledge, we're still saying mask, distance, avoid travel for now, for a period of time until we learn more or until we've reached herd immunity. <clears throat> Lisa, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Lisa just uh, was remarking on, on losing friends in Texas. I can't tell you how many friends and how many family members are uh, I, I've directly spoken to or cared for who've, who've also experienced significant loss. And this is touching a lot of us directly or indirectly. When is the best timeline to receive the vaccine post COVID exposure? I would, there is no strong recommendation. So if, if you've been, if I'm understanding this question from Tess, right? And Tess, let me know if I, I'm not answering this, your question. But if the question here is if you've been exposed or infected to the virus, when should you get the vaccine? The answer is get the vaccine the second you're eligible. We don't think uh, uh, there's some suggestion that, well, should you wait uh, a period of time, say three months from when you've been infected or had a positive diagnosis before you get the vaccine? I, in the setting of natural inf uh, infection, just get the vaccine. We don't think it's going to interfere with your immune response or ability to develop more antibodies. So you should just get the vaccine. The one except, and that goes for both infection or exposure, just get the vaccine. The monoclonal antibody situation is the one exception here. It's unlikely that folks like yourself, uh, I, presume on the, um, I, I presume I'm talking to a, a younger cohort of individuals here largely, you might have heard of these antibody cocktails from Regeneron and Eli Lilly. They're called monoclonal antibodies. They're these magic drugs, as some patients like to describe them to me, that 
if given to people that are, are at high risk of a bad outcome from COVID-19, if given to them early when they only have mild symptoms, uh, usually when they're still an outpatient at home, that it can prevent them from actually ending up in the ICU. If you say had a loved one who received one of these therapies, the recommendation is to wait 90 days before you get the vaccine at least, because we do think those drugs could interfere with a vaccine's effectiveness. So that's the one exception here. But if you've only been exposed or you've had natural infection, you should get the vaccine as soon as possible, whenever you're eligible. <clears throat> So uh, from Helen uh, asks about eye goggles. Um, I, I, I think I usually put in an age limit again. I, I think if you're 55 and older, that's when I would be, or have a pre-existing condition and are younger um, uh, or are in immunos uh, on an immunosuppressive drug sort of related to having a pre-existing condition, then I would recommend yes. I think that transmission of the virus through the mucous membranes and in, in your eyes is it's it's far less likely for all of us but I, I recommend added vigilance at least for those who are older and would have a bad outcome if exposed I think masking absolutely because we know the main transit of this virus is 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 through the nose and through the mouth the eye eye piece is a little less documented uh, but we think might might occur, but that's why I, 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 there's no hard and fast rules here, but I recommend for those who meet one of the criteria I just mentioned, definitely, I think for everybody else, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and, and certainly um, if you're high risk, I would, I would absolutely recommend it. So I would leave the ball in your court if you're otherwise healthy and don't meet a high risk category. <clears throat> Annette is asking about how long it takes for the vaccines to be effective. We think about seven to 10 days after the second dose, presuming you're getting a two dose regimen. So Pfizer and Moderna are, are examples where you need two doses and you must get two doses for you to have confidence that you're protected. We think about seven to 10 days after that, that second dose, you're good. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean you should be unmasking or hopping on a flight uh, we have to wait for the all clear and that all clear will be given to us from Dr. Fauci and our, and our federal leaders. Um, is there anyone that should not take the vaccine such as the immunocompromised? So one question I've gotten is, does, can, can you get infected with COVID-19 if you get the vaccine? And the answer is no. So if anything, if you're immunocompromised, you should absolutely get the vaccine. And uh, regardless of type, so I know, uh, you know, some people have said, well, should you get the Pfizer, the Moderna one, if you're immunocompromised, because unlike Johnson and Johnson, which is built on, it's actually built on a platform where they, where they, they put a part of the coronavirus genetic material into a, into a virus vector. So you, you're actually injecting a, a, an inactivated virus, um, which is sort of the vehicle by which a genetic material uh, that from, from coronavirus is, is presented to the body's immune system. So there's actually, it's the way the flu shot is developed is similar to how Johnson and Johnson developed their vaccine where the, the, the vehicle by which coronavirus's genetic material is introduced to the body is actually a inactivated virus vector as we call it. But that virus vector is not live, it's inactivated. It, so it's not gonna infect you or cause you to be sick. It's not gonna cause you to be sick with coronavirus. It's, it's, just, it's, un, it's just a different type of technology. So that's why if you're immunocompromised, it doesn't matter what type of vaccine you get at all. It, it does not matter whatsoever. You should get Pfizer or you should get Johnson & Johnson or Moderna, whatever comes up, whenever your number is called, you should get it. So uh, let me be clear. And I would say that if you're immunocompromised, you should get a, hopefully you should be in a high risk group and you should be getting it sooner um, than say the general population. So you should be getting it, um, hopefully you already know how to get it or have been instructed on how to register. <clears throat> Uh, 
COVID nurse friend of mine told me that COVID positive patients may continue to test positive and be symptomatic after their 10th day of isolation. However, because they have completed their 10 days of isolation, they can no longer infect people, even if they continue to test positive and are symptomatic. Is this true? So uh, it's important to recognize that while 10 day, we recommend 10 days of isolation if you've been infected, that's true, 10 days. If you're still symptomatic, then the 10 days goes out the window. So you have it's 10 days and you have to be free of symptoms for at least the prior 24 hours. So starting on day nine, you have to clear your symptoms. Um, and if you're not, then it doesn't matter if you've done 10 days, you're still potentially infectious to other people. So it's 10 days and free of symptoms like fever, shortness of breath for at least the prior 24 hours before you can say you're not a harm to others in terms of infectiousness to them. So let's, as I want to make sure 10 days matters, but it matters in the context of how your symptoms are and how long you've been symptom free. And if it's, if you're still symptomatic, then uh, you, you need to hold yourself to that 24 hour guidance. So if on day 11, you start clearing your symptoms and then say by day 14, you're free, but you, you know, you've had, you, you know, what, what, what happens, what you need to have happen is you need at least 24 hours of sim being symptom free after at least 10 days of isolation. If you've had a positive uh, uh, COVID-19 test, if you've been exposed or if, say you've traveled to see family, the guidance here is that at day five, after a high risk exposure, or if you've been exposed, or if you think you've been exposed, say if you've traveled, you should just act as though you've expo been exposed. You can test yourself at day five, and usually it takes 48 hours for a test to turn around. Um, and then you can clear yourself by day seven if you've had a negative test uh, within a week of that exposure. So, so let's say on Monday, you were you you took a flight somewhere, even though you shouldn't be flying. On Friday, you can test yourself, and by Sunday, if that test on Friday was negative, you're good. Um, or you can just wait ten days from that exposure on Monday, so I think the following Thursday, and so you can wait ten days from a high risk exposure or a known exposure, and. And then you could be, if you're still symptomatic, asymptomatic at that point, you can assume you're no longer a harm to others. I know it's complicated and a little confusing. So let me just emphasize this again. If you've been exposed, that means the Department of Health has notified you that you were close to somebody um, that was confirmed COVID-19 positive. You've been positively contact traced. Or if you think you've been exposed, meaning you flew on an airplane or were, uh, you, you think the likelihood was that you were exposed. Wait seven days with, and if, if by day, if you've uh, commit yourself to a seven day isolation and test yourself within uh, that day five to seven day window after the, either the known or presumed con, uh, exposure, negative test day seven, you're good. Otherwise wait 10 days. <clears throat> I have not seen guidelines for regarding do you know if any exists or are coming with me? Obviously, we're all eager to get back to in-person, yes. So there are no guidelines um, as far as I know yet, but they're being developed. And, they're, and and part of the reason why the, there's not guidelines is because we haven't had infrastructure. Uh, every college and university and school district has sort of been left to their own devices here in terms of marshaling the resources to do testing, surveillance testing in many cases where you test a certain proportion of the student body to get a sense of what's happening in terms of test positivity. In addition to obviously making sure classrooms aren't filled with people, what have you. I do think uh, there's gonna be now because there's a commitment to increasing testing capacity and providing federally, federal dollars to, to, for educational institutions to get more testing infrastructure, that this is, you're gonna have guidance um, accompany that. The Rockefeller Foundation, if you Google the Rockefeller Foundation and reopening schools, they've issued some guidance on the best way to reopen schools. But again, without systematic surveillance testing, you're sort of flying blind. So you need to at least test people. And especially with this new strain here, 
I personally feel strongly that it's really, really dangerous to reconvene in in-person classrooms that are poorly ventilated, you know, without the best PPE because we don't have N95s for everybody with such a dangerous overall situation happening with the pandemic. 4,400 people, again, just died yesterday. So I, I worry about reopening schools and other institutions without an, at least ensuring that people who would have a bad outcome from COVID-19 if exposed, like teachers and adult staff, are vaccinated. For all of you, you guys are adults. I mean, if you're a college student um, or older, and in, in, my, in my view, we, we should be re really emphasizing vaccination for, for everybody as quickly as possible, of course, but at least for adult staff and those we think that uh, would have a bad outcome, really, really important to save lives. Um, I, I'll take a few more questions if it's okay, Gail. Um, I'll, I'll switch over to- yeah, there, yeah, some questions in the Q and A. I don't know if you, have, can you see those? Yep. Okay, great. A few more questions on eye protection. I, I, I'll say this, if you're going into a classroom and you're, you're, you have a pre-existing illness or you're on an immunosuppressive uh, drug or if you're, all, if you're 55 and older, then yes. If, not, if none of those, there's frankly no data to guide this discussion. So I'm giving you my clinical gestalt here and my sense of the data that if you're high risk for a bad outcome for COVID-19, why not? It's not gonna hurt you. But for the rest of the general population, at least a high quality mask is, should be sufficient. Vaccine protection, duration, um, is it two months, two years, or a lifetime? I can almost guarantee you that because of this new strain, you're going to be expected to get a new vaccine, uh, likely uh, an updated version of the vaccine sometime in 2022, because we, we think the virus is changing and to make sure we don't have a recurrence of the virus and the pandemic in sometime next year, um, you're probably going to get that uh, another booster shot or whatever you want to call it, just like we get an annual flu shot. So, it's a, so I think this is a question we don't have scientific certainty on. Nobody can answer this question with certainty. Uh, but I would say because of these mutations, expect that you're going to get another shot sometime in 2022 after your shot in 2021. And then Patrick, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll, I guess I'll close um, with Patrick's question on how would um, the administration change? How might COVID-19 resource allocation of public health departments change? We're seeing it in real time, uh, Patrick, but I think, I, you know, the 1.9, uh, what was it? 1.9, I had the number here, 1.9 trillion. Uh, the spending proposal includes 20 billion to establish community vaccination programs. And um, uh, I think it was 160 billion to uh, hire 100,000 healthcare workers, among other support to local and state health departments to, to make sure we have enough vaccinators and enough infrastructure to actually get at least 400 vaccination sites up and running across the country to get, uh, to meet the goal of 100 million shots in, in 100 days. So yes, I, I, th there's gonna be much needed funding here to local and state, at least that's the commitment. Of course, it requires congressional approval, so TBD, uh, but uh, certainly that's a big pillar of the Biden plan. I think that's probably our time, uh, Dr. Gupta. And I want to thank you so much for kind of getting us back up to speed. Things have changed so significantly since you were here last in August, I believe, uh, with this emerging new data, this new evidence, and uh, of course your gestalt, which is probably probably makes us feel <laughs> really confident that um, we have the most up to, to, to date information. So we really do appreciate you returning. Hope to see you again. Um, sure. And, uh, our clinical folks and our public health professionals with some strategies to help, you know, get this curve lowered and mitigate this virus. So thank you again for your time. Uh, Gail, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everybody for what you're doing. I appreciate the comments um, in the chat and uh, uh, get the vaccine so we can uh, start planning beach vacations. That's the motivation there. That's a great motivation. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Stay safe.